Okay. As you may know, or now you will know, today is Equal Pay Day, and we have two special guests from the Council of Economic Advisors, Chair Cecilia Rouse and member Heather Boucher. Chair Cecilia Rouse recently served as the Dean of the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. She is a renowned labor economist with expertise centered in the economics of education and equality. Cecilia previously served as a member of the Council of Economic Advisors in the Obama-Biden administration and on the National Economic Council in the Clinton administration. She is the first African American and just the fourth woman to lead the CEA in the last 74 years of its existence. Heather is a longtime economic counselor to President Biden and previously served as president and CEO of the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, an expert on the impact of structural inequities on economic growth. She served as the chief economist for Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential transition team and as an economist for a range of think tanks and the Congressional Joint Economic Committee. They both have quite some resumes. Um, I'm going to turn it over to them. They will each make some brief remarks and we'll be able to take a couple of questions and they actually have a meeting uh, with the vice president they'll have to get to shortly thereafter. So with that, I will turn it over. Great. Good afternoon. It's actually, a, it's, a, um, it's a pleasure to be here today. So today is Equal Pay Day, a day that is, sim is a symbolic representation of how far into this year women must work, work to catch up to what men made in the previous year. Women working full time year round are typically paid just 82 cents for every dollar paid to men. It's a reminder of the work that remains to, to be done to advance equity and ensure that all Americans have the opportunity to reach their full potential. Because of this gender gap, women lose thousands of dollars each year and hundreds of thousands of dollars over a lifetime. The disparities are greater for black and Hispanic women who earn 63 cents and 55 cents for every uh, dollar that a white man earns. What does this mean? So a black woman must work around 19 months to earn what a white man would earn in one year. For a Hispanic woman, that is almost 22 months. So what does this really mean? It means I shouldn't be standing here today in front of you, and really I should be here sometime in August. So what are we doing about it? President Biden and Vice President Harris believe we must begin by passing the Paycheck Fairness Act. This bill would be an important step towards ending pay discrimination through transparency and accountability for employers. They believe we must provide paid family and medical leave, make childcare more affordable, and build pipelines for training that enable women to access higher paying jobs. They are also committed to raising pay for childcare workers, preschool teachers, home health aides, and others in the care economy, and taking additional steps to increase wages for American workers, such as raising the minimum wage and empowering workers to organize and collectively bargain, both of which are important to reducing the wage gap for women. We have made progress. My daughter is here today, she's downstairs, and when I was her age, the gender wage gap was about 60% compared to 80%, 82% today. That said, there is still a lot of work to do. The Biden-Harris administration is working to make sure our daughters have the same opportunities that our sons do, and to make sure that every American is given a fair shot to get ahead in this country. These aren't simply women's issues. They affect all families, the ability of our economy to recover and our nation's competitiveness. With that, I'll turn it over to Heather. Thank you, uh, thank you, Cecilia. Um, so the pandemic and the economic crisis have undermined the health and well-being of women and children in the United States. There are now 4.2 million fewer women working than there were in February of 2020, in large part because of the pandemic. Millions more women have had to reduce their hours, often because taking care of the children is a responsibility that continues to fall disproportionately on women. Our economic recovery depends on us addressing the barriers that have hampered women from fully participating in the labor force. So here's the good news. The American Rescue Plan will change the course of the pandemic and deliver immediate relief and support to women, families, and their communities, critical to building a more equitable economy. The plan will increase the child tax credit from $2,000 per child to about $3,000 per child, and even more for a child under the age of six. 
This means a typical family of four with two young children will receive an additional $3,200 in assistance to cover the costs associated with raising children. This will benefit 66 million children. The plan will also increase the earned income tax credit for 17 million workers by as much as $1,000, benefiting many cashiers, food preparers and servers, and home health aides, those frontline workers who have helped their communities get through this crisis, many of whom are women, many of whom are women of color. The plan also expands child care assistance, helping hard-hit hard child care providers who are disproportionately women of color cover their costs and it will give families an additional tax credit to help them um, cut their child care costs. Families will get back as a refundable tax credit as much as half, half, of their spending on child care for children under age 13, so they can receive a total of up to $4,000 for one child or up to $8,000 for two or more children. If we add it all up, these are historic actions that will not only help rescue our economy, they will help support our country's women and their families. But we know, as Cecilia pointed out, we have to do more to close the wage gap and to take steps to ensure that all women, especially women of color, have their shot to get ahead. And so with that, we will take some questions. Okay, Jennifer, kick us off. All right, thanks. Um, question for you both. Um, this is on racial economic gaps. During the campaign, President Biden talked about um, wanting the Federal Reserve to close um, income gaps and he wanted to measure the progress they make in, in closing those racial economic uh, gaps. Would you be willing to say if any steps have been taken so far towards requiring that sort of thing? Is the White House still interested in talking to Congress about um, amending the Fed Act to require some sort of measures? Sure, I'm happy to take that. So um, I can't speak to that exactly at that this time. What I can say is that we are, this administration, across the administration, we are committed to addressing racial, um, the racial wage gaps and, and racial inequity gaps. Um, I can say at the CEA, for example, we are using data to understand the impact of all of our policies when we study what's happening in the economy. We want to look at how it's not just affecting the average, but looking at all groups. And I would also mention that when Chairman Fowle testified uh, last, yesterday, I think it was just yesterday, and last week, he pointed to the fact that as the Federal Reserve is doing its monetary policy, it is looking not just for the average unemployment rate to change, he is looking to see that the economy is doing well for everybody. So, the, um, you know, we are, we are very aligned in that. Go ahead. Thanks for doing this. Josh spoke with AP. Lots of Americans thought educational attainment would close the gender wage gap and racial inequality. But in fact, if you look at college grads, the gap widens between men and women. Some of that is due to age, but what are the factors driving here? Why hasn't educational attainment delivered more? I'm happy. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, educational attainment was actually very instrumental in making some of the gains between my daughter, for, you know, the wage gap when I was coming up and my daughter. So we know that women getting higher years of schooling was very important in the early years. But now we know that women on average are getting more schooling than men. So that is why it is not contributing as much. And what we see then is that there are other factors. So we see that the wage gap among young adults is actually fairly small, and it opens up, particularly when women start families, which is why the care economy and the efforts we're making to ensure that workers, not just women, but all workers, can balance work and family is going to be so important. We also know that flexible workplaces is very important for helping workers to balance uh, work life, uh, you know, the work responsibilities and job responsibilities. Uh, Claudia Golden at Harvard, for example, has found that the wage gap is smaller in occupations such as pharmacists where there's just more flexibility baked into the occupation. So there's still more work to be done and I think it really goes to uh, helping women in particular, but all workers balance responsibilities of family and work. Okay. Um, Heather, you had cited the statistics on 4.2 million fewer women now in the workforce than before COVID. The president has said that women dropping out of the workforce during the pandemic is a national emergency. Are there new measures under discussion now specifically on that issue to reintroduce women back into the workforce, part of the Build Back Better plan, and what can be done to bring them back in? It's a great question. Um, you know, I mean, the, the most important thing that we need to do is wrap our hands around this pandemic. 
right? So the steps that were taken as a part of the American Rescue Plan to, um, you know, deal with the health crisis, make sure that the vaccine gets out, all of those things, that is certainly going to be an important step forward so that schools can reopen safely. And then, of course, there are funds um, as a part of the American Rescue Plan, historic uh, investment in child care centers to help them reopen safely. So um, part of what we see in this decline in women's employment is because of their, the, the fact that they're responsible for children, um, the fact that child care centers have closed, schools aren't open, um, families are trying to telecommute or they're trying to go out to their job and, and um, cope with children not having adequate care or the right care. That is really, um, I think, going to play an important role in getting folks back in to the labor force. Um, and, and I want to stress that's on both sides. Right in those caring economy parts of our economy, these are jobs that are disproportionately held by women. So, um, in making sure that schools are open and childcare centers are open, we're helping those women as workers and also as parents and caregivers. So, I think that is those are some of the first steps that we need to see. Um, but you know, over time, making sure that as you know, as Cecilia said, making sure that we have that strong foundation of the care economy on issues around childcare, also issues around um, you know how we help families that have someone who needs some extra care or sort of later in life issues, um, the aging and the disabled, along with making sure that we have workplace flexibility and we have paid leave. These are all things that help make it possible for people who have care responsibilities to be full members of our economy and our society. Andrea and Amnesia, and then we gotta, we got to wrap it up. Okay. Sorry, it's the equal payday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just very quickly in terms of the infrastructure package that's coming next, right? So that we're talking about quite a lot of money, 2 to $3 trillion. What, what specific things do you think essentially have to be part of that, and what role do, in all of this does the sort of your push for the federal minimum wage increase uh, play, and how do you, how do you convince Congress that that's an essential part? Well, I, I can take a stab at that, and then, yeah. um, so, you know, <laughs> we, we know that the, the President has been so clear throughout the campaign and into governing on what his values are and where he wants to um, guide this economy. Right, that we're focused on how we can deepen, strengthen, broaden the middle class. It's why we're so focused on equal pay day because we know that women are a key part of, you know, make up the workers that make up the middle class. Um, and he's been very clear in his support of raising the minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour. That um, that these are the kinds of um, focus that we need to have in in as the agenda is built out. This is what he's asked us to focus on. Um, alongside this, we need to make sure that that we are. Uh, making sure that the economy is directed at enhancing, supporting, building American competitiveness so that we're creating those good jobs and they're available for all people, not just some people, but people all across these United States. Yeah, I, I guess what I was just going to add to that is that right, this, this next package is really about investing in our future and making the kinds of smart investments that we know will increase growth. And we want that growth to be widely shared. So the idea is not just to increase the size of the pie, but to ensure that everybody gets their slice, unlike many policies that have followed in the past. Do you need to, I'm sorry, do you need to like include some kind of private sector initiatives to nudge those companies that aren't moving along as quickly? Look, I, we really can't speak to the specifics. I think you're used to Jen saying she likes to keep her job. I kind of like to keep mine too. <laughs> um, um, so we are, you know, we are looking at the most effective ways in order to make these kinds of investments that we know are just so important to our economy. Thank you so much. I think just to follow up on Karen's question, you know, making sure that there is support for the women is one thing, but. Will there be any concrete measures in the Build Back Better plan to make sure the 4.2 million women have jobs to return to? Right, that is the exact purpose of the American Rescue Plan, right? The whole purpose is to get us through this pandemic with and to help our businesses that are viable stay in business, to help the workers who need help paying their rent um, and, and getting food on the table to stay engaged and not just imagine that they're going to drop out and drop out forever. We know that the longer that we have the economic crisis and the longer that workers are out of the workforce, the harder it is for them to come back. So that is the entire focus of the American Rescue Plan, is to get us back on track so that by next year we are back to essentially full employment. Right, thank you both so much for coming. Thank We'd you. love to have you back. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, I just have a couple of other items for you all at the top. Uh, as you know, this afternoon the President and First Lady will be joined 
by Megan Rapinoe and Margaret Purse at the White House for a virtual event with other members of the U.S. Women's National Team, where the President will sign a proclamation marking Equal Pay Day. Additionally, the second gentleman is in St. Louis, Missouri, for a listening session on gender equity in the workforce. As Cecilia and Heather just detailed, the pandemic and economic crisis have undermined the health and well-being of women and children. The American Rescue Plan provides help for women and families by increasing the child tax credit, expanding child care assistance, and providing women and families the relief they need. It also provides $130 billion to help schools serve all students and reopen. Uh, yesterday, on the anniversary of the Affordable Care Act being signed into law, the President, of course, traveled to Ohio. Um, it was a great trip where he announced that uh, the administration would expand access to health care coverage by extending the special enrollment period until August 15th. I know a number of you noted that, but I just wanted to reiterate it since it was late in the day. Uh, this morning, the President uh, was proud to sign into law the Save Lives Act. The bipartisan piece of legislation will give the VA the ability to provide vaccines to all veterans and boost vaccine efforts for veterans, families, and caregivers. It's truly a testament to what government can do when we work together. He's grateful for the leadership of both the Senate and House Veterans Affairs Committee, uh, both Chairs Mark Takano and John Tester, and Ranking Members Mike Boss and Jerry Moran. Um, as we announced this morning, but to give you a little bit more detail, the President will travel to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania next week on Wednesday, March 31st, where he will uh, deliver a speech laying out more details of his plan to build the economy back better. Over the next several days, and this is probably why they were hesitant to give more detail, he will continue meeting with his economic team to finalize details of his proposal, including the scale, scope, and final policy components. His focus, of course, will be on investing in America's workers, making sure the tax code rewards worth not wealth, delivering on the promises he made to the American people when he was running for president. Uh, with that, go ahead, Josh. Thanks, Jen. Um, on the shooting in Colorado, the president said Congress must act. Senator, Senate Majority Leader Schumer has also said the Senate's poised to act. But Vice President uh, Harris said today on CBS that uh, she thought the change would have occurred after the Sandy Hook shootings. And I'm curious, what does the president think is different this time, and how has he changed his approach so that this administration can pass these changes when in the past it failed? Well, first, the president shares that sentiment, as I think many Americans do, that when we saw uh, 20 children uh, murdered, uh, when we saw uh, six adults murdered, that that would turn the tide of uh, Congress. We have seen uh, data and statistics uh, still uh, across the country still broadly support uh, background checks. Uh, I think it's about 80 percent of the American public support background checks, including a good percentage of gun owners support background checks. We've seen states take uh, action since that time. A number of states across the country have put in, in place a number of laws. Sometimes states are the leaders, as we know, and we've seen in other areas of policymaking. But I think the president who has been in public life and public office for 50 years, more than 50 years, would be the first to tell you if he were standing here that just because you don't get uh, the policy making, the legislation done the first time, it doesn't mean you quit trying. And certainly uh, tragedies like we saw earlier this week, like we saw last week, uh, mass shootings uh, that are uh, killing innocent lives, leaving family members without their loved ones, is a reminder of how important and vital that is. Uh, he has talked about, as he did yesterday, uh, the importance of working with Congress. I knew the Vice President touched on the fact that if we want something to be permanent, if we want it to be lasting, we need it to be legislation. He certainly believes that. But there are also uh, executive actions under consideration uh, that we will continue working through internally. And there's lots of levers you can take, obviously, as President and Vice President. And, and then secondly, um, today's the first chance for many in the media to see the situation on the southern border mm -hmm. at government facilities. Yeah. Um, this is the first step of transparency. What else can we expect with regard to that so that we can evaluate the situation and present it to the public? Well, first, as you noted, um, I know all of you have covered this, but just to kind of reiterate where we are here. So there's a delegation of members of Congress and White House officials who are traveling to uh, the Office of Refugee Resettlement at Cruzo Springs in the, in the Influx Care Facility there. Um, there is a network pool camera 
uh, that will be a part of this journey, which will be a, which will ensure that there's network pool coverage or network pool footage, I should say, that is provided to all of the networks so that you can all see as the media for yourselves and be able to provide analysis on that um, B-roll footage. And we are also remain committed to transparency and will continue to work with agencies on creating avenues for media access uh, to and visibility into these facilities. So uh, I think our balance is, of course, privacy, as you all know. Uh, it is also that we are in the middle of a pandemic uh, and that, uh, you know, these facilities, of course, can't become uh, forums for media access all day long, every day. Uh, I think we all agree on that balance, but we will continue to look for ways to increase transparency and provide additional access and fulfill requests. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Jen. A couple questions on guns and sure. the API representation. Um, at what point would President Biden consider taking executive action instead of waiting for Congress to wait? In other words, how many measures would have to fail before he stepped in? I think he sees it as a, um, vital to take uh, steps on two tracks um, because congressional legislation, as the vice president conveyed this morning, obviously has a more permanent lasting impact. Uh, executive actions are, of course, a, an important lever that every president has at their uh, disposal. There's current discussions and analysis internally of what steps can be taken. That, that has been ongoing for several weeks, even before these two recent tragedies uh, that, um, you know, he looks forward to uh, getting an update on and, and seeing what can be moved forward on that front as well. So he's not waiting for anything to fail is, is really the answer to your question. Uh, what executive actions do you think he's most likely to take? Uh, it's a great question. I have it myself as well, um, but it's an ongoing policy process internally. I will say that his view, the vice president's view, and our policy team's view is that um, it's not just about uh, addressing uh, gun access. That's important. Uh, and obviously, there's legislation that's under consideration on background checks that they both strongly support. They want to see move forward. Uh, it's also about addressing community violence um, and uh, you know a range of issues uh, that are root causes and, and kind of lead to the the uh, the deaths and the uh, and the uh, impact that we're seeing that's so troubling. Got it. Thank you. And then on the other issue, um, you know, the White House had conversations with uh, Senators Duckworth and Hirono. Mm -hmm. um, I think one concern that they have brought is is the question of who is advising President Biden from the AAPI community as we see this surge of violence. I know Ambassador Rice and Cedric Richmond are leading the engagement mm -hmm. efforts. Who, who in the AAPI community is having direct conversations with the president about what's unfolding? Well, you mentioned uh, Cedric and uh, Susan Rice, who have been doing listening sessions uh, for some time, and obviously those will continue to pick up. Obviously, the vice president, who is the first in the meeting and the last in a meeting uh, on every issue, including the impact uh, of the violence and the threats uh, and the uh, that we've seen increase over the past several months against the AAPI community, uh, as a member herself of the AAPI community, is certainly uh, a playing a, an important role on that. And as we noted in a statement we released last night, uh, we are also uh, adding a, a senior level Asian American Pacific Islander liaison who will ensure the community's voice is further represented and heard, not just around crises, not just around an increase in violence, but uh, in general and uh, you know, playing an important role with a seat at the table. To be clear, this is a new position in addition to the one over um, in public engagement? Th this is the one that we announced last night. It's going to be a new senior level position. Yes, so, Addis, yep. Mm -hmm. Will this person also have a policy portfolio or will it just be mainly outreach? Uh, I can get you more specifics. I mean, I think that uh, when they're all the roles that are in our liaison, playing liaison roles, uh, typically have a seat at the table on a range of issues. So whether it is health care or uh, climate or uh, community violence. Um, so typically uh, it's having a seat at the table on a range of topics, but I can see if there's more specifics. Obviously we have not hired yet because we just announced this last night. Thanks. Go ahead. Uh, to follow up on you just question, uh, on the president, we were, we were talking yesterday about executive action on gun reform. Mm -hmm. The president also was making it clear he wanted to see Congress act yes. that several times. Yes. Would he propose uh, his own gun reform plan that he would present to Congress, as we've seen him do on the COVID relief plan and what we anticipate coming on the economic plan. 
would this be something that could originate here and not wait for Congress to move? You know, Karen, I think it's a great question. There's obviously a lot of pieces of legislation that have been proposed. Uh, there's these two background check bills that are have moved their way through the House. There's also legislation that's been proposed by Senator Feinstein, Congressman Cicilline, uh, that addresses uh, some uh, uh, banning an assault weapons ban, which is something the President worked to pass in the 90s when he was at, uh, in the Senate. Uh, so there's a range of steps that can be taken to increase gun safety measures. What our team is looking at now is what is the legislation that's out there? Are there any gaps that need to be filled? Policies or proposals that have been introduced in the past that could be reintroduced. Uh, so I don't have anything to predict for you on whether there'd be something independent. I think we're looking at what uh, a number of passionate gun safety advocates on the Hill have already introduced to see where we can help uh, push the, the boulder on that. Has the president spoken to any of the families of the Colorado shooting, any of the victims' families? I don't have any calls uh, to read out for you. Um, you know, he, he uh, is somebody who obviously has a deep connection to loss, um, and uh, we don't always read out those calls. I can check and see if there's anything uh, that has uh, that he has done that he would be uh, comfortable conveying to all of you. Can I just do one more? Sure, go ahead. Uh, could you give us an update on progress from the Family Reunification Task Force? Have there been families, children reunited back with their parents? Where does that stand right now? There, there have been, uh, and a lot of that has happened through lawyers and outside groups and the NGA, NGO community that plays an incredible role here. There will be an update provided at day 120 that will be more of an official report and update uh, out of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, so in advance of that, I'm not sure we'll have incremental updates, but there have been uh, some progress made thanks in large part to the work of uh, legal experts and NGOs on the outside. The task force is working with those NGOs? They're in, in touch with them as well, uh, but we'll have our first formal update at day 120 and then I believe every 60 days thereafter. Go ahead, Jeff. Jen, why did the president wait until there was another shooting, until he addressed gun violence in America? Uh, he actually addressed it. We put out a statement in his name on the anniversary of um, uh, in early February, the anniversary of the of the shooting uh, in Florida. Um, so he has addressed it before, and I certainly has addressed it even as president, and will continue to address it as president. And as you know, Jeff, from covering covering him in Congress for a long time, this has been a passion of his, uh, putting in in place gun safety measures throughout his career. That's why he fought to uh, get the Brady Bill passed. Why he fought to uh, ban assault weapons. Why he was the lead in the Obama Biden administration and putting in place more than a dozen executive acts. Uh, to uh, to make uh, it safer for our communities, and it's something that he will continue to work on as president. Of course, he knows though, that the president's bully pulpit is unparalleled, and yet it took him until more than 60 days into his presidency to talk about gun violence on camera in America. What does that say about his commitment or how much political capital he's willing to spend on this issue? Well, I, I first would say that anybody who has been following um, the tragedies and the shootings that have happened in our country over the past several years, if not decades, knows that this is an issue the president is deeply committed to, and his, career, his uh, career is evidence of that. And I don't think anyone who's an advocate is looking at how many words he's spoken. They're looking at what his uh, background has been, where he has fought the fights, uh, and he has fought the fights on the Brady Bill, on the assault weapons ban, on getting legislation passed. It wasn't successful, as was uh, alluded to earlier in a question. Uh, we know that. Uh, but this is something he's going to put uh, his shoulder into. He's going to work with members of both parties. He's going to uh, certainly advocate for. And I think for uh, for those who have survived uh, gun violence, for those who have lost family members, they're really looking for action, and they're really looking at the record uh, that he has or he has over the course of the decades of his career. If I could follow up on the the question on the border, the access being granted uh, today for the pool is of a facility that is aspirational of where you want to move. Uh, these children. Mm -hmm. What about access to the facilities where there is overcrowding and there is an actual uh uh, problem. Why was this one chosen over those? We're also open to providing access there, um, and we, this is just the first step in a process of providing greater access to the media. And when would that decision be made? You said earlier in this week that uh, you would be working on access. Is this the only access, or will that be coming? In no, the I would. Like the I would consider it. It's, it's ongoing, and we wanted to provide um, pool coverage, as you all know, who are in the television. Uh, field of television that allows for video a video camera to provide access to all the networks. We felt that would be a good first step and we're looking forward to continuing to engage about how to provide increased access. Would you agree though that you've chosen the, the facility that is, uh, is the aspirational facility as opposed to the problem at this moment? 
Well, I, I would say we all agree that the, the Border Patrol facilities are not places where children should be. They are, um, children should be moving more quickly through those facilities. That is what our policy central focus is right now, as, as you know, Jeff. And there are also, it's also uh, becoming a public health concern uh, because of the number of kids who are moving through those facilities and the fact. Why not show those to we, we, we will, and we are working with the Border Patrol and with uh, DHS to, to determine how we can do that. Yes. Go ahead, Jennifer. Um, on Iraq and withdrawing U.S. troops from Iraq, could you please give us an update on um, Iraq's request for the start of talks on, on that withdrawal, please? That's something we are looking forward to uh, convening uh, next month, um, and I'm not sure if I have an update other than, than to convey that we look forward to our strategic dialogue with the government of Iraq over the month of April. Uh, the meetings will further clarify that coalition forces are in Iraq at the invitation of the Iraqi government and solely for the purpose of training and advising Iraqi forces to ensure that ISIS cannot reconstitute. And we are committed first and foremost to Iraq's sovereignty. We look forward to these important discussions with Iraqi leaders on the future of our partnership that will convene uh, next month. Go ahead, Andrew. Got a couple of quick ones for you. So on Nord Stream 2, that is an issue that keeps coming up in the relationship with Germany. Mm -hmm. How soon do you think those sanctions will be implemented? And has the president um, had a chance to discuss this issue at his level with the chancellor of Germany? I don't have any uh, calls, although we do read out the calls that he does. So you would certainly know if he had a call with the Chancellor of Germany, I can assure you. Um, so not a new one uh, that I'm aware of that you are not aware of. Um, we continue to believe it's a bad deal. Uh, I don't think we have an update on the, our policy position beyond that. Okay, and then um, 14 states have now sued the administration over the oil and gas, over the pause in oil and gas leasing. What do you say to that, and how do you move beyond that? I mean, how do you, how do you, you know, I realize there's a legal process, but how do you address, how do you get your point across in this legal environment? Well, I would say first, um, oil and gas jobs aren't going anywhere. Uh, the outgoing administration flooded the oil markets with cheap federal leases. This will not affect oil and gas production or jobs for years to come. Uh, and what President Biden has pledged to do is invest to create jobs and ensure America leads the clean energy revolution, which is where the industry is largely going anyway, where there is the greatest opportunity for job creation. Uh, he wants to create good paying union jobs. And uh, that's something he believes and he's committed to doing. I think there's a lot of, um, uh, there is some misinformation out there about what this means, which is why it's not, no, I'm not saying from the media, I'm just saying in general. Um, and uh, again, there are oil and gas jobs that are out there. The existing leases will continue. He's really talking about future leases. Okay, and then just one more um, on the gun issue. I know this is kind of a crazy question, but. Oh, it's always a good lead-in when it's a crazy question. <laughs> it's quite a lead-in. Given the history of, of people trying to enact gun control yeah. legislation in this country, is there some consideration to taking a look at the Second Amendment and, and just addressing it from a sort of the, the underlying constitutional right to bear arms? Does that, is that something that the President feels needs to be called into question so many years after the revolution? No one is talking about overturning or changing the Second Amendment. Um, what our focus is on is putting in place common sense measures that will make our community safer, make families safer, make kids safer. Uh, the majority of the American public supports background checks. Uh, the majority of the American public does not believe that anyone needs to have an assault weapon. Uh, so uh, that's really what our focus is on at this point in time. Oh, Joe oh. Manchin is not in support of this. Once again, you have a Democrat, a member of the president's own party, who is already signaling that he will not support that. You have a very slim majority. Can you convince Republicans to support this legislation so that you can work around a Democrat that's not supporting it? As the President said yesterday, we don't know yet. He hasn't done the vote count, um, but it is certainly an issue he will talk to members about and convey why he feels it's so important, that it's not a, shouldn't be a political issue, that keeping our community safe, family safe, uh, looking at the track record as what has worked in states, which is very informative, and actually to Josh's earlier question, something that we know more about now than we may have 10 years ago. Um, so he will he will be uh, conveying that to, to members he's, he's communicating with. Go ahead. Uh, two questions. Uh, following up on Regis questions about representation, um, the Biden administration is the first in 20 years to not have an Asian American lead 
one of the 15 executive departments in the cabinet. So how does the White House square that fact with uh, the president's pledges to make this the most representative, most diverse um, in history? Well, I will just say the president remains committed to making sure this is the most diverse administration in history that has always been, remains our goal. We've made a lot of progress. Uh, we have the most diverse cabinet in history, uh, we, but we will continue to make progress. Uh, we have AAPI staff at senior levels and at all levels of the administration, and we will continue to work to find ways to elevate AAPI voices uh, at the highest level of government. Uh, there are a number of um, uh, cabinet level. I know it's not 15 members, so but just to, to note, obviously Catherine Tai, who received a overwhelming support in the Senate in her approval uh, uh, to be confirmed for USTR, uh, Julie Sue at the Department of Labor, uh, Kiran Ahuja, I'm going to butcher that name, and I apologize to Kiran uh, at OPM, Todd Kim, the Assistant Attorney General at DOJ. So we will continue, and obviously there are more positions and roles uh, that we need to fill. And I will say first and foremost, the president's view is that we need to listen, and uh, that is an important component of how we're communicating um, with members of Congress as concerns arise, also with leaders in the community, as he and the vice president did last Friday, uh, why it's so important as we look to policy making to have senior members of our administration do listening sessions in the community to, to determine uh, how we can best address needs. Is it there's personnel, of course, and we will continue to work toward that. There's policies, uh, and that's part of our objective and our focus at this point in time. And also, a quick one on guns. Um, the president also talked several times about a federal assault weapons ban, and I'm wondering how he plans to build a coalition around that, when, even when that policy is something that is opposed by many moderate Democrats in Congress. Well, though it is supported by the majority of the American people, uh, and that is an important fact. Um, and uh, he will, it's something that he has ha long had a, a view and a belief that uh, no one needs an assault weapon, uh, that it is not something that should be uh, a part of what, um, what people have access to in this country. Um, and he will uh, continue to, um, so it's like, you're asking kind of who will he talk to or who will he... Well, part of it is certainly communicating with the advocates. It's communicating with uh, outside groups, with gun owners, many of whom will tell you that they don't believe uh, they, they would support an assault weapons ban. Uh, communicating with leaders in states where uh, laws have been put in place that have been impactful. And obviously having conversations with members he's known for some time, having them at the staff level, and determining if we can find a path forward. Go ahead. Thank you, Jen. I'd like to ask you uh, two questions. The first about marijuana, and the second about a bit of a historical mystery. I'm hoping you could help us solve. Okay. Uh, <laughs> There's a lot of setups for these questions today. I like it. Go ahead. Uh, sure. So, uh, Vice President uh, Kamala Harris says that she is a past marijuana smoker. Uh, she said, quote, it gives people joy, and we need more joy in this world. Um, she is with a clear majority of the U.S. population in supporting marijuana legalization. According to polls, two-thirds of people do, including about half of Republicans. Mm -hmm. uh, yet last week, the Daily Beast reported that there were dozens of White House staffers who were either disciplined or ter terminated from their jobs for past marijuana use. Uh, you seem to confirm five terminations on Twitter. Um, and my question is, why would President Biden allow this to happen, especially considering uh, the White House staff were led to believe that pot use would not be disqualifying, and especially considering the Vice President is herself a former marijuana user? Well, let me first say that um, what, what we tried to do as an administration was work with the security service, who actually makes these determinations about um, about uh, suitability uh, for serving uh, in government. Uh, in the past, and I served in the Obama-Biden administration, the rules were actually far more stringent. Uh, so that isn't about uh, anyone's personal point of view. It's about working through the process, the history, and modernizing it and taking steps to address the fact that marijuana is legal in a number of states across the country. It is still illegal federally, right? We know that. Uh, there were, as I noted, I think in our comment last week, uh, five individuals who are no longer employed at the White House. A number of them, there were other uh, security uh, issues that were raised. Um, and you know that's an unfortunate conclusion, of course. But uh, but what we tried to do is uh, enable additional uh, members of the team who would ha not have been able to continue serving in past administrations to continue serving by uh, updating our policy in coordination with the security service. Follow up on that. Uh, surely, President Biden could you know 
implement changes here unilaterally and just say that these people can come to work for him? Well, I think Why? if marijuana was federally legal, that might be a different circumstance. But I don't, I don't think I have any more for this on you, uh, on this for you. Go ahead. Do you have any more data on the number of people impacted other than the five people who were terminated? I don't have any more data for you other than to convey that there were a number of people who would not have been able to serve in past administrations. And because of our efforts to modernize uh, and uh, work with the security service, they're able to serve. Did you have another question? Yes, I Okay. Um, so uh, this is a, uh, as I said it up, a bit of a mystery, and I'm sure that you've inquired about this yourself. And, oh, okay. Uh, Where's the cat? <laughs> no, no, yeah, no yeah. it's not that. Okay. Uh, yeah. So there was a report last year from the Senate Finance and Homeland Security Committee. It claimed that the wife of Moscow's former mayor uh, paid a company associated with the president's son $3.5 million. Uh, there was no explanation for this alleged payments, and I'm wondering if you could tell us if uh, that claim is accurate, and if so, uh, what the $3.5 million was paid for. Not familiar with that claim. Doesn't sound like it's backed up by a lot of evidence. Uh, if you have evidence or specifics, happy to discuss it's it further. The committee's report. Not, so you haven't asked about this, or? I, I'm not familiar with the report at all. Um, go ahead. Thank you, Jens. With the May 1st deadline uh, looming, when do you expect to hear from the president about the timing on uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan? Uh, it's a good question. As you may know, uh, Secretary Blinken is currently in Brussels and talking uh, with our NATO uh, European partners. He did a press avail, I believe it was yesterday, but let me reiterate a couple of the points he made, and, and then I'll get to your question. Uh, that our focus right now is, to sh is, is for him to share some of our thinking with our vital NATO partners, consult with them, hear from them on uh, where they th see things going, where they want things to go. Uh, that, as the President had said last week, uh, it's tough meeting that May 1st timeline. And the Secretary of State reiterated that in his remarks as well. Whatever we do will be informed by our allies uh, and partners. Uh, but uh, the President is currently uh, discussing, of course, with policy team members on, on uh, what is possible, and uh, I, hopefully he'll have an update soon, but I don't have a timeline on that for you. An announcement this week? I, I can't give you a timeline. It's really up to his own decision-making uh, and when he's prepared to talk about that publicly. Go ahead. Thank you, Jen. Um, I have a couple of foreign policy questions. I understand the administration has already supported COVAX, is working with the mm -hmm. to ramp up production, uh, working out details with Mexico and Canada, but where is the president's position on the request by more than 55 countries, as well as some Democratic lawmakers, on uh, making vaccine patent through the WHO, giving a waiver to that. Well, the, the top priority uh, of the President's uh, and of the United States is saving lives and ending the pandemic in the United States and, of course, around the world. That includes investing in COVAX, working with partners, as we announced with the Quad, to produce a billion vaccine doses to surge vaccine production and delivery. As part of rebuilding our alliances, we're exploring every avenue to coordinate with our global partners and are evaluating the efficacy of any measure by its true potential to save lives. So that's how we're looking at it through the prism. There are probably, there are a number of steps and number of ways we are engaged in addressing the global pandemic through the global international community. And we'll look at a range of options, but I don't have any update for you on the patent question. As a general principle, do you believe that protecting American innovation and uh, intellectual property of pharmaceutical companies outweighing the benefit of moving faster towards a COVID-free world? Sure, I, I absolutely understand your question. What I'm conveying is we look at every option uh, through the prism of whether it will save lives and how many lives it will save and uh, try to put our resources and efforts into those that we think will be most effective. Um, you know, obviously part of that is through engagement with the WHO. I mentioned uh, our quad partnership, uh, our meaningful contribution to COVAX. And of course, when we can, we will share vaccines as we have already, uh, as we're already doing with Canada and Mexico. But uh, we're looking at a range of options. Right now, our focus is on continuing to address uh, the pandemic that is ongoing in the United States, given a thousand people are still dying every single day. Another part of all of policy questions, please. Uh, so can you comment on media reports on whether the administration is considering joining a, a group of South American nations to push back against Chinese illegal fishing? How big of a problem does the administration see this kind of Chinese practice of distant water fishing? And would this be something that you would consider with other, other regions, including Southeast Asia and Africa? 
Sure, it is a challenge and a problem and one that we're watching closely and for others who have not been following this issue as closely, it is an issue of overfishing uh, in certain parts of the world. Uh, it is something our national security team is certainly watching and following closely. Um, I can see if there's more specifics on their engagement to update you on. One domestic question. Go ahead. That's the question on uh, vaccination for federal government employees. Mm -hmm. I mean, so far, it's been pretty much where they live, right? I mean, if you're in D.C., you follow D.C. rules, Maryland, and so forth. Is there any other kind of consideration from, from the White House to just expand uh, access to vaccines for federal government employees? It's a great question. I'll have to check with our COVID team. Uh, obviously, everyone will be eligible in just over a month, uh, including our, our government employees. And D.C. and Virginia have already made that commitment. Maybe Maryland, too. I don't want to leave them out. Um, so that is good news for every federal government employee. But I can check and see if there's more specifics across the administration about our approach. Go ahead in the back. And we'll go back. Um, a couple of questions. First, I wanted to ask about voting rights. The Senate right now is debating its own version of the For the People Act. Yeah. Um, it, there are a few hangups with it in the chamber. I was curious how much um, emphasis the president plans to put on this, um, if he will be reaching out directly or if there's a team from the White House that's working on this issue. Yes, I would say we're very engaged, um, closely engaged on um, uh, S-1 uh, that is uh, being negotiated, as you said, and there are changes being made, which we fully expected that there would be, as a number of senators, I believe, have alluded to that being a possibility and things they'd like to see changed. Um, so it's working its way through the process. We get regular updates. Uh, our legislative team does, uh, and we remain very closely engaged. And I wanted to ask, um, Leader McConnell has said that he hasn't been invited to the White House and he hasn't had a direct conversation with the president since mm -hmm. the inauguration. Uh, I think so he corrected that statement. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was curious, because um, I know previously um, uh, Leader McCarthy had said that he had tried to reach out to the White House to get an invitation here. Um, does, does the president plan to have some sort of big you know, meeting with leaders from across the aisle um, it, where we would see photos of them together and things like that? I'm sure he will. We obviously have been limited on COVID to any events in the East Wing. And at this point, we'd, we'd be very much in the East, the Easter egg roll preparations, which of course we will not be, but obviously more important, substantive, vital meetings than that. He's had a number of meetings, bipartisan meetings in the Oval Office. He will continue to do those. Those have often been constructed with committee chairs or, or, um, or members with specific jurisdiction. Uh, he has he has a long friendship with uh, with Leader McConnell. He has spoken with him. Uh, he speaks with him regularly. Uh, we're obviously not going to read out all of those calls. Um, I expect that will continue. I wanted to ask. We've been seeing a lot of images of spring breakers, especially in Florida, mm -hmm. and I was curious um, how aware of that the president, if he's being updated mm -hmm. on that regularly. Um, and if he plans to make any sort of address or public appeal to people on the issue. Well, we, we, we do watch that closely. The president is briefed regularly by his COVID team. Uh, and of course, he has seen the news coverage, thanks to all of you, of spring breakers uh, who have been gathering uh, in far too many numbers. Uh, there, of course, were steps uh, taken locally um, in, in, in response uh, to this. We also watch that closely. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure, I'd, I don't have anything to, to preview for you in terms of him addressing spring breakers publicly. I will say that his message, broadly speaking, is that we are still at war with the virus. Uh, this is still a threat to uh, the lives of the American people. We need to be vigilant. We need to wear masks. Uh, we need to hand wash. And that is a message, of course, directly to anybody who is not abiding by the recommendations of public health officials. Just one more. Um, do you have any update on uh, the president's plans? Will he be traveling to Boulder? I don't have any updates on that. Uh, as you all know, this tragedy only happened just uh, about 36 hours ago, and uh, obviously that would be done in consultation with local officials um, who, I'm sh who I know are still digesting the events and uh, in their community, working on healing in their community. I, I can note, since you reminded me, he did speak with the mayor this morning as well, and he had spoken with the governor yesterday and will remain in close touch. Uh, well, let me just go to the back and then we'll come back. Go ahead in the back, Lal. Thank you, thank you Jen. Um, Last week, Secretary Blinken and NSA Jake Sullivan had a meeting in Ankara with the Chinese counterparts. Have they, have they given a briefing to uh, the president on the China policy? Has it, has it, does that, has it changed any Chinese policy of the Biden administration? 
Although I know that the president has spoken with Secretary Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan since their return. I don't have any. Uh, obviously, they talk about a range of national security issues, ongoing policy processes that are ongoing. We're currently taking stock of where we are, which includes co close consultation with allies and partners. As I noted, Secretary of State is in uh, Brussels currently uh, on the way forward, and we'll continue to work with China going forward uh, when it's in the interest of the American people. So we're in c consulting internally, consulting with our partners and allies, and that's really the stage we're in at this time. I have a question related to legal immigration. When Vice President was a Senator, she supported the cause of uh, EAD, employment authorization cards for H4 and L2 visa holders. Now these guys are saying, most of them are women basically. They're saying there's very long delay in issuing EAD cards for H4 and L2 visa mm -hmm. holders. Some of them have also went to the court. Uh, what is your, uh, why there is delay in that? Uh, I think part of the reason we want to push for uh, action on immigration on the Hill is to move forward with expediting the processing and, and doing that on several levels, including uh, a number of the visas that you just uh, just introduced or just conveyed. So that's part of the reason why we think that's such an important piece uh, to move a forward fin on. A final one. A uh, number of Indian American doctors whose job is to treat patients during this COVID, COVID era they are on the hill uh, protesting against and demanding elimination of country quota for green cards. Uh, I know the White House has sent a legislation to the hill and that talks about that, but they're still protesting against uh, and faster implementation of that passes of the bill. Uh, what is President message to those doctors? I think the president uh, is, would would reiterate that he believes that uh, there should be faster processing, that our immigration system is broken uh, at many levels and uh, of, of the system, and that he is eager to for Congress to move forward with action there. Okay, two in the back. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Uh, I'm back on guns. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned bipartisan meetings. Um, I'm wondering if you could give a little bit more of a sense of uh, the president's engagement with Congress on gun legislation specifically. Does he plan to have a bipartisan meeting on that at the White House? And has he sp spoken to Senator Manchin at all about his opposition to that uh, background check bill? I, I don't have any meetings to predict. Obviously, um, you know, this is an issue that is there are a number of passionate uh, gun safety advocates on the Hill, as you well know. Uh, who have strong views about what the path forward should look like. So I have no doubt that he has discussed this issue with them over the course of the last two months of his presidency. Uh, as it relates to the tragedy of Tuesday night, he was, of course, in Ohio all day yesterday with a very full schedule. So I don't, he didn't have any calls yesterday, but um, you know, it's something that he will continue to look for ways to engage, to discuss, to advocate for action moving forward. And is there an update on his joint session to Congress? No update yet. Um, we have a speech coming up next week, um, and we uh, certainly he remains interested in and committed to doing a joint session. We remain engaged with them, but I don't have an update on the specific timing. And if I can just ask one more from uh, one of the reporters in the pool who can be here. Um, there was an Axios report today that he met with historians to discuss how aggressive he could be um, on his economic agenda, among other topics. I wonder if you can confirm the meeting and maybe tell us who was involved and why he felt the need to meet with historians on this? I will tell you, presidents love historians. I know those from this is my second president working for. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's important to learn from uh, what uh, worked and didn't work in the past and uh, gain perspective from people who study that. Um, so um, he did meet with historians a couple of weeks ago. I don't have the list of names in front of me. I can see if there's more details we can provide. And really, it's meant to have an open conversation about the challenges we're country, our country is facing and looking back at history. And it's a moment to step back and, and, and reflect and, and use it as lessons moving forward. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Um, a few on spending, one on taxes as well. I know you can't get into specifics at this point, but what the president is being briefed on uh, by his economic team in the upcoming days, is this an infrastructure package? Is it the president's Build Back Better plan, combination of both? G give us an, an overview of, of what, it, what it is. Well, our Build Back Better agenda, his Build Back Better agenda, includes a number of components uh, that he talked about on the campaign trail. Infrastructure is part of it, uh, making the tax code uh, fair and one that rewards work uh, and not wealth is part of it. Uh, doing better by our caregivers is part of that. Increasing access to health care uh, is part of it. Uh, 
investing in our clean energy economy is part of it. There are several components he talked about on the campaign trail. And right now what he's talking with his economic team and advisors about are is uh, what the scale, the scope, and the components will look like uh, in what he's going to move forward and propose next week. The $3 trillion number has been put out there. Um, I know the White House hasn't confirmed that, but it, is, is it possible that it goes above $3 trillion? Like is $3 trillion viewed as the cap, or it's certainly possible it could go even higher? Well, again, I think what we're looking at is all of those components, as I just laid out, all of which may not will, will not be in a speech next week, right? This is a big, big components of his agenda that he talked about on the campaign trail. So, uh, and right now he's having a conversation about the scale and the scope of what proposals uh, look like. There's lots of ways to frame it, to shape it, to size it. Um, so I don't have any more to predict for you. Last, last one on this uh, before taxes. Um, speaking of size and scope, it's possible if it gets broken up that infrastructure could be one. So what is the president, what is the White House view as infrastructure? What falls under that umbrella? Under infrastructure? There's a lot of ways to look at infrastructure. I can't preview for you. I know you're not exactly asking this. What will be in the package that he's still discussing? But obviously, roads, rails, and bridges are part of uh, what everybody historically thinks about. Uh, but there's also um, components like our cyber infrastructure. There's lots of ways to look at infrastructure. But uh, how what what is in a package that he proposes in the coming months? I, I don't have anything more to detail for you. And then on taxes, um, the White House says now that families who make up to $400,000 won't pay a penny more under the president's uh, potential plan mm -hmm. um, to the federal government in taxes. So, Which is 98% of families. So what about individuals? If you're an individual and you make up to blank, you won't pay more to Uncle Sam. What What is that number? $400,000. So the individual number is going to be same as the joint filer number. Well, the no more nobody no individual making uh, less than hundred four hundred thousand dollars will pay more in taxes. So if you're an individual and you make three hundred thousand dollars, let's just say that's less you, than four hundred, right? If you're a married couple that makes three hundred and one fifty. That's more than four fifty. The three hundred isn't going to traditionally taxes. The joint filers pay about it's double. But you're saying now it'll be the, the same rate. I think we'll have more to say when we actually roll out a tax proposal, which we have not done yet. So this is a commitment he made on the campaign trail, which he's committed to abiding by. But uh, once we propose a tax proposal, we'll have more to discuss on it. So just to be clear, individual filers, if you make up to $400,000, you're an individual. You will not pay a penny more, just like families won't pay a penny more. That's right. A quick one, as a yeah. bowler from a yeah. TV colleague who can't be here today, yeah. can you give us an update on Major and Champ and whether they're oh. at the White House? Yeah. I was <laughs> waiting for this to come up. Uh, <laughs> of course. Um, Champ and Major are here at the White House. Uh, they joined the first family at Camp David last weekend and returned with them on Sunday. Dogs will come and go, and it will not be uncommon for them to head back to Delaware on occasion, uh, as the President and First Lady often do as well. Um, Is it about the dogs? <laughs> okay. um, on Colin Call, he's one of the President's on the yes. top Pentagon posts. He barely just made it out of um, committee right now. Can you say, is the White House still behind his nomination? It's been controversial from the beginning. Any thoughts on that? Absolutely. Uh, Colin is qualified, he's experienced, um, and he would bring uh, an incredible reservoir of uh, perspective. Uh, to the job at the Department of Defense, uh, so we look forward to his confirmation. So no consideration whatsoever of withdrawing his, his nope. nomination? If I could close the loop on, uh, on a Leader McConnell question. You said they speak regularly. He says that they've only spoken one time. He corrected his statement saying they spoke one time on Burma. Mm -hmm. Have they spoken beyond that one time? I don't have any more calls, I don't think, to read out for you, uh, which we, we will not make a, a case of doing, as you know. Uh, so. I don't have more to read out Has for you. Has the President's definition of bipartisanship changed since he um, arrived in office on January 20th? No, his, his definition of bipartisanship has always been uh, working on behalf of the American people and governing for all people, whether it's Democrats, Republicans, independents, and moving forward on proposals and policies that will make their lives better. With or without Republican votes? Well, he doesn't believe that bipartisanship is defined by uh, the zip code here. He believes it's on how we can deliver relief to the American people. Thanks. Okay, thanks everyone.
timing when you might announce a replacement for Neera Tanda? I Never. do not. I do not, but Shalonda Young has confirmed she will be the acting, um, and so, uh, but I don't have a personnel preview for you uh, on that particular role. Jen, can I have one more question on uh, China vaccine diplomacy? Is the administration doing anything specific to push back against requirements by China for countries to cut back or reduce ties to Taiwan? Is the administration I will check with our national security team if there's anything for that on you. On that for you. Thank you. Thank you.